to Between the Covers. I'm so delighted today to be joined by poet Linda Trot Dickman. Linda is the author of Road Trip, along with a host of other books, and we are thrilled that she's going to be teaching a poetry workshop for Red Penguin coming up starting next week. I'm also thrilled to be joined by author Marguerite Maitland. Marguerite is the author of Runaway at Sea, an adventure story, and has so much to share about writing and researching her grandfather's story. You're really going to enjoy the show, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Stephanie Larkin, and I am Beyond a thrill to be joined today by poet Linda Trot Dickman. Linda is a fabulous poet and is also going to be collaborating with Red Penguin Books on a number of projects to be able to bring poetry to our fans out there and to create seeds of poetry and more baby poets, shall we say, coming up. And I'm thrilled that Linda's not just a fabulous poet and teacher, but I consider her a friend. And I'm thrilled that we've had this chance together. And when you see her, she also looks like my clone because we have this twin <laughs> going on. <laughs> you see, we even dress alike, Linda. <laughs> Except for one key difference. Your necklace is rocking it out of the park. You have to show off that necklace a little bit because okay. I am just, look at the pink, the red penguin necklace. Yes, a little I, pink highlights, but red penguin. I think somebody is happy that she's a penguinette now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving that. And if we weren't on Zoom, I would just come right over there and grab it right off your neck. I knew that when I put it on, you were going to want it. And I thought, oh, okay, I, I have know. to start looking I'm, already. <laughs> I'm sitting here on screen and I'm like trying to grab it from you. <laughs> If I were a really good film editor, I'd manage to get my hand to go out of my little box and right into your box. Oh, I think, they use, I think they use TikTok for that now. There's oh, like is that how I do? I think that's how they do it. I don't think I'm young enough to use TikTok. I think that's, that's I, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure they're using it at school now, so I would have to learn it just because. Absolutely. Something else to learn after, after well, there are some things in your upcoming poetry workshop you're going to have to teach me too, like ekphrastic, but we'll get to that. Yes, <laughs> yes we will. Yes, we will. Uh, so I know I have here Robes, The Art of Being Covered, which has got to be the greatest title I have ever read for a poetry book. I love the title alone. Um, the Air That I Breathe, and I hope you have a copy there of Road Trip to hold up. I do. Yes. Fantastic. And again, if I can get my hand to come right through the screen, I'd, <laughs> I'd grab that from you also. <laughs> well, I have to go to the post office today to send a, to put a package in the mail, and I'll put another package in the oh, mail. Thank you, because I'm the queen of road trips, so I definitely need a copy of that with those beautiful pictures and poems uh, that you've been reading every day on Facebook, too, which is lovely. Today was my final broadcast of road trip. Oh, my gosh. So what's next on the agenda? Um, I'm thinking about that. Um, I, there's actually two, two thoughts I have about that. One is we took two road trips and I took notes on it, but I didn't write the poems that I might have written and I've got all the photographs. So there's a chance that there's a second road trip book coming. Nice. And surely um, there's also a really good chance that there's a Mr. Halloween series coming. Um, for the last 25 years plus, I've, my husband and I have been co-authoring Halloween poems for a very special actor and his wife up the street, and um, they're both artists, and we've been doing our shtick up there for 25, 26, 27 Halloweens, and so we're thinking of doing a Halloween series. Boy, the things I don't know about you <laughs> <laughs> could fill a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's what we're that's what we're about. I, I I'm pretty sure I have to go through my photographs like you know ten minutes after I get off the phone or off the interview with you to start looking at road trip two. Wow, I, I love the way you just come up with these. You know, one of the things that people say to me when they want to start, whether it's poetry or you know creative writing of any form, is I don't know what to write. 
people will say, I want to write, but I don't know what to write about. And yet you've got, you know, three things you can do next. How do you decide? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, what, the, the easiest thing to say is maybe I've decided that I'm going to do a series on tomatoes because my mother loved tomatoes. My grandmother loved tomatoes. And so we had a legacy in the family called the Tomato Queen. And, I, and, I, and my father also was a, a person who loved tomatoes. He used to love to go in the garden with a salt shaker. And he said, the heck with bringing it in the house. You lick it, you pour some salt on it, and you've got a snack made in heaven. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the tomato figured largely in my family. So that just was unnatural for me. Um, but I will say that sometimes I will notice that I've written about things that I didn't even realize I was writing about. So I will come up with, I, I will start to jot down phrases in my writer's notebook, which is downstairs right now. But I will start to jot down a phrase, or if I don't have a writer's notebook, I'll do an Emily Dickinson thing and take an envelope, a menu, whatever I've got, <laughs> and write something on it. Um, and so then I notice, like, you know, David and I are driving. If I'm doing the driving and I notice something, I say, honey, honey, write this down. There's a ribbon of birds in the sky. <sighs> and so when I see that, I have somebody's writing it down. And then on the other side of that, I might notice a theme developing. So I've noticed, for instance, that birds do figure in, my, in some of my poetry, even though I would not say I'm a bird poet. <laughs> Are there because people birds, who consider themselves bird poets? I, must I, I had a classmate at Adelphi who um, everything always had a bird in it, every single poem. That's not my, sh that's not my hallmark. Were um, any of them about penguins? I just need to know. I actually started a penguin. I have a penguin poem Gee. that I never even thought of till right now. And I will, I will write that down too. <laughs> um, I had thoughts of making it into a picture book someday. And I wrote the verse and gave it to a friend and she sketched out the bird and then told me, gave me some suggestions. And so it, it grew into a larger poem. Wow. It's about a penguin that goes to the park in his tuxedo to have tea. <laughs> you are so creative. <laughs> I, I, I love was to kidding about the penguin poem, but here she's got a whole penguin going to the park to have tea in a tuxedo. <laughs> okay, now I need to see this penguin poem. <laughs> now I need to find the penguin I'm gonna poem. I'm going to frame it. I, you know, this is my new office here. I have some empty wall space. That's getting framed. <laughs> okay, I'm on it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so when people say they don't know what to write about, you would say, just open your eyes. It sounds like just well. Be here. Um, the best advice. Some I've got some very wonderful advice from two specific professors at Adelphi, and the one said to me, uh, Professor. Her name is Judy Baumel, and she she is amazing. And she said, if you're bored or if you've got writer's block, take a walk around the block and notice things. So one day, no joke, I was walking up the street and it was spring and hostas were pushing through the soil and they looked to me like Tolkien's kingdom, like the kingdom of Mordor oh. with all the terrible dark walls coming up, spiky tops. And I, I quick wrote it down or took a picture of it, whichever came first. And then I, I wrote something about that because I wasn't looking for it, but there it was. Right. And so when you walk around the block, if you do it enough, you see different things every time you walk around the block. So, okay. so this past couple of weeks, I've noticed somebody must have gotten a strip of wildflower seeds and sewn it along their outside fence because I notice a pattern of the wildflowers. And so I, I mean, that's, that's germinating just like seeds. It's just up there waiting to come out. So I know I write it down. Okay. Are you this scary observant about everything? Like if I were your husband, should I be worried? Cause you notice everything. I, I hesitate to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> because in the <laughs> olden days when people were smoking inside of buildings, or, or my, I can remember, you know, my father and mother had at least two big parties and I can remember some, one of the gentlemen doing this 
And I went and got him an ashtray and he said, what are you doing? And I said, aren't you going for a cigarette? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I just got you an ashtray because I thought you were going to get a cigarette out. So I noticed I'm a people watcher. I do know, and I'm a, I'm a watcher. I do notice. What I look for, I look for the good. <laughs> well, thank God, because we're on together. So I'm getting really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> are we goody four shoes <laughs> <laughs> i'm very relieved you're looking for the good so because you, <laughs> you could be using those powers for evil and i'd be worried <laughs> well yeah it, it could happen it could happen and when i'm angry sometimes i notice things i, sh I you know but i mostly that doesn't make it onto paper at least not to the public because poetry okay so keep this on poetry poetry some of it we write for ourselves some of it we write for others and some of it we write for a general public okay so i mean if i write a tribute poem for you um maybe people that you know will understand what i've written about but it's specifically for you mm -hmm. if i write a poem for instance i told you i have a series of poems called the angry poems that when somebody has upset me, I, I don't know quite what to do about it. I write a poem about it and get it out of my system so I don't let the anger eat at me. Mm -hmm. But I have a rule about those um, poems, and they are that uh, I, I, one of my students said to me, Mrs. Dickman, you've got to forgive people if you write an angry poem, and I, I, I committed to that. So nobody has seen but one of my angry poems, which does not mean I have a long list. And it does not mean I haven't forgiven a lot of people. It just means that it happens at God's time. Yeah. That's so good. that's the way it goes with that. Well, and so, the, and some poetry is written so that everyone, like Road Trip, can identify with it. Right, right. I'm so glad you categorized that because, I mean, you know, I'm so uh, proactive about wanting to, people to be able to be published, should that be their desire. But the way you categorize that sometimes... You're writing, and it's not to be published. It's writing for yourself. It's cathartic. You need to work through some thoughts. And writing poetry is a great way of working through thoughts. And then in the second category, poetry is a gift. Not just that you're giving yourself, maybe, in this first category, but you can give someone the gift of a poem. And that doesn't mean that it's for the general public. It doesn't mean it was a secret, perhaps, but but only they are going to get what you're saying. And then there's the general public. So there's different reasons for writing things. Indeed. And we shouldn't always aim for the general. If you only aim for the general, you're missing out on giving yourself the gift of writing a poem that was just for you. My husband and I have been writing love poems to each other our whole marriage. And no one has seen those except my husband and myself because they're not for anybody else. Um, and so it's, it's just important to, you know, you don't always know what the poem is going to be or who it's going to be for, but you have to get it out and then you kind of find out Ugh. what it's for. I didn't know that Road Trip was going to appeal the way that it did. Um, and yet the feedback that I've been getting from my daily readings has been amazing. People who have been there, people who have not been there, people who've always wanted to go there. <laughs> Um, it's been wonderful. So, yeah, it, it, I don't always know what category the poem is going to fall into, but it's important to me to do it, to write it. Oh, so good. I do love the story you told me about how Road Trip came to be published. Can you tell us a little bit about that? There was a contest, I believe. So we have a local, um, a, a local publisher. Um, his name is James Paul Wagner, and he owns and runs local gems press and every year in april he has a contest that you have to enter in march and it's you write 30 poems in 30 days and it's on the honor system and you you write the 30 poems and and by may 5th ish you have to submit those 30 poems in a book in a format that will lend itself to a book and um I did that. I did it for four years. The first year, I didn't even get honorable mention. The second two years, I got honorable mention. And the last year, 2019, I won first prize. 
and and what happened for what what happened for me in that book was I stopped worrying about what I should write that might be award winning and I just decided to have fun. And then I thought of all the road trips we took as kids and what did we do? We didn't have all the things that kids now have and we sang and we looked at license plates and we looked at road signs and we looked at landmarks. And so I started to think about the singing part and I wanted it to all be musical in mm -hmm. some way. So that's what I did. I just had fun with it. So I took notes for thir the time we were away and I didn't look at them again until it was time for the contest. And then in 30 days, I wrote 30 poems. Wow. And you won. Sometimes letting go, huh? And I, yes, I let go of worrying about who was going to win and thought I, it doesn't matter. I just had the most fun I've ever had writing a book. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was good. So that yeah. was a good thing. Well, I love what you're saying because it, it gives people an idea of that poetry can be approached from different angles. You know, sometimes I think people think poetry is over here and you have to be specialized. And, you know, I, I always think, wow, those poets, man, they have to, every single word counts, you know. Somebody who writes longer, you know, prose, you can have some bad words in there. A poet, every word, every syllable matters. It seems kind of unattainable. But the way you're describing it is not like that. It's like something that you can let pour out of you. That's how it feels. That's how, I don't write unless I'm moved. Um, I can write if you say, write me a poem about blah, blah, blah. I, I can do that. Um, and sometimes it's a good thing. And sometimes not such a good thing. But I, I, I don't have a problem taking the risk of trying. Um, I, I, I'm ready to do that. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, you've got to let it. What is it? my other professor that I call my beloved professor, Jacqueline Jones Lamont at Adelphi? She always talked about using, let the poem tell you what the work of the poem is. Well, should I try to write it as a, should I try to write it as a pantoum? Should I try to write it as a haiku? Let the poem tell you what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a matter of getting it all out and trying a couple of different forms to see where it fits. Now, did you say the word pantoum? Yes. Did I miss that in our, because I, I learned a lot setting up now. Linda is going to be teaching um, a poetry workshop that I am over the moon excited and I'm going to have to crash because I was looking at the outline of the classes and what's coming up and I did not know a lot of things here. So I am definitely going to crash. I'm going to crash when you're talking about ekphrastic, which I looked up because now I know what that means. I'm totally going to crash for blank verse because I have no idea what blank verse means. I'm picturing blank paper. I was really lost with that one. And now you said pantoon? Yes. Okay, what's a pantoon? <laughs> a pantoon is a Malaysian verse form imitated in French and English, oh. consisting of quotations with an ABAB rhyme scheme linked by repeated lines. Now, I took the oh. liberty of looking something up here. Um, there, I believe Oscar, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein did um, a pantoum in Flower Drum Song. Really? And I'm looking, I mean, if you, if you don't mind me just doing a quick- No, thing. no, I, very cool, I had no idea. Um, I'm sure I saw Flower Drum Song. Okay, he wrote, he wrote a, a piece of music called There Is Something About This Place. Okay. And, and it's in the Flower Drum Song. And I, I hope I didn't get the form wrong. And I, well, I thought about it, but he, it, you, if you heard the song, it makes total sense. And for me, there's so much music involved in poetry because my mother sang and danced and listened to, and I don't mean professionally, I mean in the kitchen, you know, she, she sang and she danced and she had music going 24 seven. It seemed like when we were kids, there was always a record on the record player. And she had Sunday through 
Friday was her realm. Saturday mornings was my father, who at whatever time he woke up would put on John Philip Sousa marches, and, <laughs> and we were told it was time to get up and work. Really? <laughs> so I, we have a, a full complement of music in the background. My brother's a musician. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. And no so, wonder you're a poet. Growing up with that kind of a household, of course you're a poet. I had, yeah. My father, my father used to speak in metaphors and similes. Really? Okay, so here's the best one. He said one day, honey, don't go looking for a boyfriend the way that just on, on the surface. You have to treat it like a resume. And if someone doesn't fulfill the least amount of job requirements, you can't take them on board. And then he said this, think about it as an assembly line. He said, you look at an assembly line for cars and people put the same part in the same place all day long. He said, but every once in a while, a car will come off the assembly line and it will be a cream puff. It'll be unlike any other car in the line. It's just great. He says, you want the part that makes you that. You want the part that, that makes it all work together. And I thought, wow. So did I have a choice? <laughs> no, not with that. What else could you possibly have turned out to be? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. A teacher. <laughs> yeah. Well, you are a teacher. And a librarian. And a librarian. And all of it comes together. And, and you know how I feel about librarians. I have said it many, many times that as far as I'm concerned, librarians are the most brilliant people who walk the face of the planet. And I wish you were running the world because librarians know everything. If you need to know anything, ask a librarian. Well, we know where to find the information and we don't quit until we do. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, all of us at this point, quite frankly, are walking around with all of the knowledge of the entire world in our hands. I mean, this, is, this has got the Library of Congress. This has got every library since Socrates. It has everything. And yet, what do we do with these things? We look at fat cat videos. <laughs> well, or we, do, or we do something else. We have all that information in the palm of our hand. And we ask somebody else the answer when we could look it up ourselves. Yes. You see it all the time on Facebook. Absolutely. Because people don't read. No. Pe and, and they and, don't. And, and people don't. ask me things constantly. I get emails all day long. Um, I'm on Gmail and I can't figure out how to get someone into my contacts. So what do I do? I go to Google and I say, how to get someone into your contacts on Gmail? And I send them the link. Hey, wait a minute. I'm kind of like a librarian. <laughs> yes, it's important. And it's a simple question. And sometimes it's so easy to, instead of do this, to go, why can't they just look it up? But we don't because that's not what we do. So no, we send them the link. And when you're in the library, you send someone in the right direction instead of saying, look it up. My job. My, my, my father did it. My mother did it. Dad, what does this mean? Get the dictionary. Dad, can't you just tell me? Look it up. So we do. We do. We do. I had that giant, you know, 26 volumes of the Funkin Wagnalls Encyclopedia, and we had to look it up. Okay, so the name of the song is I'm Going to Like It Here, and it's from the Flower Drum Song by Rodgers and Hammerstein, and the poem's form is a pantoum. Ooh. So I, I, I remembered correctly. I just had to confirm it. I love that. And I would totally suggest, if you haven't ever seen the movie, to see the movie. Okay. If you can't see, if you can't see the play. And I listened to that, and I can remember Mayoshi Yumeki singing the song. And I just loved it. And I thought, gee, some of those lines sound familiar. They sound like they repeat, but I didn't know what it was. Until I got into Adelphi, <laughs> we had to write a pantoum. <laughs> flower drum song. I know that. <laughs> yes, indeed. So this is what's going to happen to people in your poetry workshop. You're going to talk about something, and they're going to have that light bulb moment that they realize that that they've seen it, they've heard it. It's in music. It's someplace, and they. It's already inside of them. Ooh. It's already inside of them. I am, you know, I might be facilitating it, but what I'm really doing 
is drawing the music out of the student. Oh. And, and I think that all the, whoever signs up, I'm going to meet a new group of teacher, teachers. So, I mean, my little friend, Polly, that who, whose mom, you know, so well, um, it, it, he, he would sit there and make these brilliant statements. And I would say to him, you understand you're a good teacher. And on the front of my library, I had a sign that said, everybody who enters here is a teacher and everybody who enters here is a student. And that is, that is my core philosophy in life, that we are all, we are all teachers, we are all students. And my job is to just bring it out or help you bring it out of yourself. Love that. Absolutely love that. I also love when you and I spoke about a poetry workshop, and you've run many, many poetry workshops of all ages. And you had certain ground rules since people are sharing something that is so intimate of themselves. Would you mind talking a little bit about that? Because I was, I was so thrilled and I think I'm gonna steal your ground rules because I run my own writer's workshops and I never once before meeting you thought about things to say to people in advance as far as um, commenting on other people's work. I will be honest, I've run things, I've said, so do I have any feedback on that? And I've never once thought, I should set some parameters here. And when you told me about the way you run your poetry workshops and things you say, I was blown away and I'm stealing every word of it. So would you? <laughs> okay, so um, number one, you don't have to love somebody's work to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear people read, it's important to listen to when they read their own work or give you their own work. It's important to look at the things that, the things that you can appreciate about the work. Maybe it was their delivery. Maybe it was their use of rhyme. Maybe it was their use of synonyms instead of saying, you know, the book is red. Maybe you could say, you know, the, the covers were crimson and get some alliteration in there. Um, and so it's important to appreciate things about someone's poem, even if you don't necessarily either care for the poet, care for their work, don't like whatever they're saying. It, 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 you have to find something to appreciate because I've learned from a lot of people. I don't have all their books, but I've learned from a lot of them. And um, the other thing is, uh, God bless Jackie Jones Lamont because she said, what I appreciate about this poem is the following, and she would tell you. And then she'd say, she would not say, I don't like, she would say, what I resist in this poem. Now resist gives you a whole different mindset. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the high end of the standard for me. Jacqueline Jones Lamont is the high standard. She is an amazing poet, an amazing human being, an amazing, oh, my beloved professor. And okay, so that being said, the other end of the spectrum is former poet laureate Gladys Henderson. I was sitting in her workshop last year and read a poem and someone said, oh, I like this, I like that, I like that. And then they said, we think you should change this word. And, and one of them said, yeah, didn't we decide that? And Gladys <laughs> said, excuse me, the poet, it's the poem belongs to the poet. And they make the decision about what word to keep and what word to not keep. So that will not be happening. We don't vote, we are not voting on a word in, in my workshop. We don't do that. We appreciate, we resist, and we encourage. Mm. And we give as much positive feedback as possible. And the other golden word, in my opinion, is consider. One of my classmates, um, Arlie Middendorf, um, told me, Use the word consider because it gives the poet the, cho the choice of making that decision. Mm. And so I say, consider using this word instead. Right. Because it's your poem, not mine. I love that. And you know, if we would think about this, not just in poetry, but I mean, every minute of every day, someone is asking an opinion. Do you like my jacket? <laughs> you know, yes. Like that. <laughs> yes, I know you like my jacket. <laughs> But, but too often we are so quick to impose our opinion, and quite frankly, we oppose our opinion as truth 
we think our opinion is the truth and it's subjective. But even one step beyond is what yours goes beyond just acknowledging that my opinion is subjective and going into respect of the person, the artistry, and the vulnerability that they are showing in sharing it by using words, you know, like consider and appreciate and resist and things like that. You're, you're far beyond just, you know, whether or not you even respect the person, but you are actually holding them close because I would think a poetry workshop could be a pretty vulnerable place to be. Yes. Yes. I, I sat, I sat in one, I won't give you any names because it's still nope, running. Nope. Nope. Um, but I sat in one where somebody actually did take a vote just in the middle of their poem. They said, let's vote on whether or not this guy gets to keep this word. And I, I never went back. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> the, the person reading it didn't go back either. I mean, uh, goodness. Yeah, yeah, that's not the place. That, yeah, we, I, we, not that I can even think of what is the place. I mean, maybe, and it sounds like you've learned to be so incredibly careful with people and their artistry from professors. And I'm delighted to hear that because I would, I would be almost a little afraid that in school, they feel free to kind of hash you over the coals. So I'm, I'm, not to I'm not telling you that there are not those professors in the world, mm -hmm. but I am telling you that, the t you know, uh, there are more than two, but the two that really, really stood out to me were the two I mentioned. Yes. Because they, they modeled what they expected us to do and they gave us the tools to do it properly. And, and so, yeah, it's important. It's important to build up. Very important. It's so important to build people up and not tear them down. The whole world is trying to tear us down. Let's at least be those people who build. Yes. I love that. So at the end of the workshop, um, people will end up not just having poems, but I, I'm hearing learning a whole lot about themselves. What I love about any workshop is a kid that may, or a, a kid, I say a kid because I kid, think they're five, well, kids, adults, they're all kids to me, yes. all God's children. But I mean, <laughs> people will take a risk that wouldn't have taken a risk before. Mm. Um, even if you get one line out of a, a, a student that never would have written before, you've got one more line than you would have. And so it's all about people taking a risk and being careful with them. Yes, that's so important. To encourage them, yes. Thank you, thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. Tell our, our viewers a little bit about what's next on your agenda. Um, I know that you're like something on Long Island and I can't remember what it is right now. And I remember yelling at you that it wasn't in your bio. So what was that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, 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 what I do right now is I'm the poetry coordinator for the Northport Arts Coalition. Well, maybe that was the one that didn't make it into your bio. Um, and I am also, uh, I also run um, a workshop at Samantha's Little Bit of Heaven. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I can't, oh, and I work at the, the Walt Whitman Birthplace with students yes. and classes when they come in. Um, and I'm very excited to tell you this because it just happened. I was accepted by poets and writers to be a part of their database. Ah. I had to fill out an application and they had to think about it, so I'm in. Yes! <laughs> so I'm very excited about that. Oh my gosh, that is super exciting. That means like, you're official. It's like, I'm grown up. <laughs> <laughs> a grown up poet, that's fantastic. <laughs> As opposed to a baby poet. Yeah. So we'll have some baby poets and, and then they grow up and this is what happens. Or they might be, you know, adult poets that are fledglings, but, yeah. we, but we are all going to be learning from each other. Absolutely. Well, congratulations on becoming a full-fledged grown-up poet. Thank you. <laughs> so these next books that are coming out, we're not sure what's going to hit print first, whether it's Road Trip 2, Halloween, Tomatoes, tomatoes is not in print yet, is it? No, that's going to be, okay, so that's another idea. Mm -hmm. I want to do something called the Tomato Queens and do a chapter on each of the queens. Okay. Um, but really sitting on my desk right now, I have one, I'm one poem short, and not because I haven't written it, because I need to revise it, of doing something called the reading list, which is my life in picture books. Oh. 
and it's all my favorite picture books and fairy tales and how they affected me and how I, so I'm, I'm one poem away from being done with that. And I already have a reader who is a poet who I admire uh, greatly. And um, uh, he's a local, um, I mean, I don't know, do I dare tell you who it is? <laughs> I mean, his name is Brendan McEntee. Mm -hmm. And he is a wonderful poet and a, a wonderful encouragement. And so oh. he, he is going to read my manuscript in addition oh, to my, my in-service incredible partner, David, who, who is, is my best editor ever. How does that work when, when your best editor ever is a little close to you? Well, <laughs> in the beginning, in the beginning, I did a lot of resisting. <laughs> I would him, hand him something in a creative font and he would say, Times New Roman 12. And I would say, ugh, it's boring. And then I went to, back to school and what did the professor say? Times New Roman 12. <laughs> And then I began to understand that my husband knew all along. He's in an, he is a, an intuitive editor and an incredible poet as well. And um, he's the best support I've ever had. Oh, wonderful. Across many married. lifetimes. Even though you're, he's your editor, he, you're still married. Yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> he's amazing. Now, are you also his editor or no? Yes, occasionally I get the privilege of looking at something and giving him feedback. Ooh. He is he is a good poet. He well, really is. And sometimes he lets me tell him things. <laughs> <laughs> Was it hard the first time he edited you? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I don't I mean that poem isn't even published anywhere, but it's one of my favorite poems because it's not because I haven't I, I never tried to publish it. I just I love pine trees so much. I really think that, you know, heaven is someplace between a pine tree forest and an orange grove because of the aromas of those two places mm -hmm. and a little baked bread thrown in, you know, a little oh. fresh baked bread. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Maybe some coffee. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he, he edited me and I, I was so resistant and, and he was helpful. I mean, he always is helpful. I just, the important part is consider. You know, that it's such a big word. It's such a small word. Right. But it's a big task to consider. <laughs> I'm so glad you spoke about that because, you know, any of us, whoever is doing our editing, we want the feedback, but we're not quite sure how to take it. And in a marriage situation, I can only imagine where that goes. So speaking openly about it, you know, my husband is a, a fabulous editor too. And sometimes I can be resistant. Well, I mean, the thing is that it's not so much what he says, it's how I receive it. Mm. And if I've asked for your opinion and you give it to me, resisting is not a great idea. <laughs> you know, I should be able to receive it in the spirit in which it's given. And I, you know, to be totally transparent, I don't always do that. Yeah. No, I get that. It's not easy. It's not easy. So we're talking about all of us on the, those who are, uh, privileged to have the role of commenting on someone else's artwork, we need to be very, very intentional and conscious of the responsibility we have. But on this end also, if you are going to ask for some feedback, you have to trust that it's given with the best of intentions and be open to receiving it. Yes, indeed. Not yes, even. Indeed. Yeah, I just, it just happened with a poem on the wild swans. I thought I had only one poem to go. I had two. Oh. And the wild swans was one of my favorite fairy tales. And it's not necessarily a well-known, but it's Hans Christian Andersen. And I wrote this two-page epic. And I was told two different ways. This is not what you really want to say here. Wow. And I said, then I'm not writing it. That's it. I'm done. And then about a month later, I sat down and like that, it came out. Oh, I made it my own story. You don't know how free it is for people to hear that a professional award-winning, yes, poet as yourself has these problems. You know, that's, that's so incredibly freeing for mere mortals like myself who 
or still stuck on roses or red, violets or blue and not sure what comes next. I love this. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I, you know, I just have to be, I, I, it, I would be remiss if I did not remain transparent. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you from me and from all the other people out there watching who think, I want to do it, but I don't know. She looks so perfect. I bet everything she writes comes out perfect and it just no. rolls right off the pen. <laughs> if, I pan, if I panned the room, you would know the answer. Stacks. <laughs> stacks of things that are revised. Really? I keep the revisions. Do you really? Yeah. I want to see, what the, I want to see the evolution of the poem sometimes. Not for everything, but some things. So you revise in pen? Sometimes, and sometimes I revise in it, open a new document in my, on my uh, Google Mail or I mean my uh, Google Drive and write another one or Word, whatever I'm working in. Interesting. I never thought about that. And that again, that was David. Don't do it on the th on the draft you have, honey. Make that A and make the next one B, and then do the work on the second one. And I went, Err, and then I did it. <laughs> what an idea! I never even thought about that. My husband is so good. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Because then you can look back and learn from the evolution. I, yes. I always love when I have new authors that I'm working with and you know, my, my editing staff will, will edit books and they'll, you know, for expediency, of course, often just do it on screen. But sometimes I will ask, listen, I'm going to print a manuscript here, stick it in a binder, the good old fashioned way. And I want you to take a red pen and, and hand edit because I want to give it back to that author. They're learning, they're growing. They need to see why a professional editor chose what they chose. I don't want you just to read the, the finished one and say, wow, that does seem to go better. Here's one for you. There's a blog I follow called Two Writing Teachers. It's for, it's for teachers of, of elementary school primarily, but they deal with all ages of children. Mm -hmm. And one day they said, we read our poems to each other and we don't really see every word on the, on the page. We read our stories to each other and we read what we know is in our heart that we think is on the page. So when you revise your work, take a highlighter and highlight every word as you read it or highlight the articles or highlight the punctuation and look at every single thing. And when you find something, you know, mark that thing because we're so used to seeing what we know is in our heart. We think it's on the page and it isn't always on the page. That's so true. That's so true. So I, I have all these great highlighters that I give to my, my poetry students because I, there's so many ideas that cross over between, between types of student. I use the thing because it works for me. I'm a visual, auditory, hands-on learner. Right. Oh, what a great editing tip too. Just, just purely, I mean, whatever you're writing, if you're writing a school assignment, if you're, you know, to realize, to recognize that your eyes are not the final say. We do see what we think we want to see. And yes, and, and I can't highlight her great. I, I can't even tell you how many times I've read a poem in public and someone's following along in the anthology or my book, whichever. And they will say, you know, the words, this is what the words said on the page, but this is what you read. What did you mean? And I said, gee, I think I'm revising my poem at, live. I think <laughs> I just revised my poem live and, and I might change it in the next edition. And you see that in uh, poetry books when you see versions of this poem have appeared in the following publications. That means the poet's continuing to revise. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea. Just when you think it's done. <laughs> <laughs> so it's I never think, done, folks. <laughs> well, I think it's because we have to use such an economy of words that we want every syllable to count. Exactly economy of words there's a phrase i'm loving <laughs> I, I said it much harsher than that earlier um when i said you poets only have a few words so you have to make sure they all are good ones economy of words even the way you describe the fact that you don't have a lot of words is so poetic <laughs> thank you 
very <laughs> kind. I'm telling you, I'm gonna have like post-it notes all over my office. Economy of words. That's a good one to remember. Well, you know, be you can Milton Burl me anytime. Just take whatever you need and bar and use it. I will be stealing left and right. <laughs> Consider it a gift. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, where can our viewers find you and your poetry? Besides on redpenguinclasses.com to sign up, because that's a biggie. Um, my books are all available under Linda Trot Dickman on both Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Okay. And if you if you get one of the books, um, please feel free to write a review. I'm thrilled to have them. Not just feel free, please write a review because <laughs> authors every place um, desperately need reviews. Um, you know yourself when you're on Amazon that you buy things that have lots of reviews over things that don't. Um, doesn't take very long, please write a review. For, for Linda, but for all authors, do them that graciousness that's highly appreciated. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am always thrilled. I told you I will be crashing into your, uh, your poetry workshop so I could learn myself. Um, but I am thrilled to, that we're partnering together to bring poetry and, and the love of language to more and more people. I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. Oh, you're very welcome. And I can't wait to read Road Trip in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going downstairs to put it in the mail. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And thanks for joining us, everyone. Hi, I'm Stephanie Larkin, and I am so thrilled today to be joined by author Marguerite Maitland. Marguerite is a fabulous author, teacher, and friend. And I'm thrilled that we're going to be offering a creative writing class hosted by Marguerite at Red Penguin. So I asked her to join us to talk about writing, teaching, and what you can do to get started. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for having me. I love doing the show with you. It's, it's always a ton of fun. So um, I hope it's as much fun as writing. Is it as much fun as writing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, sometimes writing can be a little frustrating. Uh, sometimes writing involves not writing, you know, kind of staring at the screen and thinking about writing as you're walking. <laughs> and the park and you know things like that so sometimes writing is not actually writing but um i think it's fun i love it was it sylvia plath who said i'm not sure if it was her um I hate writing but i love having written do you ever feel like that that the act of writing is like mm, but but seeing your name on a book very cool it's really super cool like mm -hmm. i can't my yeah here it is i can't <laughs> right there there it is there it is there's the name I there know, it is. Yeah. I, i'm sure there are times that writing means not writing yes lots of research sure writing means not writing um and getting stuck sometimes you just get stuck you don't know quite where you want to take it so so you walk away but i, I just never stop thinking about it. that's I'm always thinking i'm always looking at things in the environment around me, how can I translate that? Does that give me a new idea? You know, it comes from, comes from all over the place, but it's always in your head. <laughs> so, would you uh, tell our readers, uh, viewers, a little bit about Runaway at Sea, the story behind the story and why you right. So Runaway at Sea is uh, the story which is based on the life of my great-great-grandfather, Robert. Uh, his full name is Robert John Henry Frost. That's a name. And, yeah, and a, a long name, just like mine. I have a long name too. Uh, in 1849, he was 12 and he was in an abusive relationship with his brother, was really not being kind. And um, he decided he had quite enough of that. And he went um, off running through the woods with his, uh, with his best friend and they stowed away on a ship, which they thought was just going to bring them one port somewhere else and that they would work for their passage and turned out to be a British naval vessel. So when they were found in the, yeah, whoops, a plan without a plan, and it went a bit awry. Uh, so they got found in the lifeboats, they were disciplined, they were pressed into service. And so this 12-year-old kid and his 14-year-old friend were terrified to ever leave the ship. They were, you know, had the fear of God put in them for to, to desert. And all of a sudden, he went from the pan into the fire. So now he's in this situation. He can't swim. He can't read, you know. Um, so he's in this situation. 
learning this entire new world, but he threw himself into it and he figured it out. And he spent, um, so this is book one, the whole story needs three books. So book two is in, in progress. So we're almost there with book two. Um, and book three will finish the journey and bring him across America. Uh, so um, it's a really fascinating story of this uh, incredible courage and perseverance and adventure. And many of it could have gone very, very wrong in any, and if you read the book, you'll see <laughs> how many times it could have gone very, very wrong for him. Um, but he survived and he figured it out and that's why I'm here. So it's a little, um, it's a, it's a little bit strange that's to be able to say that. If wrong, you wouldn't be here. That's right. Any, any of these things, and this <laughs> went wrong, I would not be here. So I was originally given the journey, uh, the journal of Robert's story by my grandfather, who was his grandson or great grandson. Um, and, um, um, so when I, I got the journal with a, a trinket, a little wooden shoe that was Robert's, um, I just kind of set it aside. And it wasn't until after my grandfather died that my grandmother died that I even remembered the story. And I went and I pulled it out and I read it and I thought, this has to be told. Somehow it has to be told. So that's how it started. That's where it came from. I, I just love that story. And you got inspired from you know, a gift from a family member, and now it morphed into, not just this, there's two more of these to come. Yeah, there's two more. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. that's fabulous, because so many people I know that I meet at writer's workshops or wherever, uh, really, really have a driving desire to write. But one of the first problems they have is they say, well, I don't know what to write about. So I love how you came about to this story. You, you weren't just sitting there saying, well, I could write about birds or flowers or anything else that you, know, that you had this inkling that the story found you. And I think so many times the story does find you, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. And actually going through the whole process of learning the craft, because I started it not really, really knowing what I was doing. I just started writing, thinking of what would a 12 year old feel in this time period. And then I had some people read it and then I started some research and then that's when things started to really rock and roll. Um, and, and going to critique groups, reading it aloud, you've got to be really brave when you're doing that because I would pour my heart and soul for two weeks into this 1500 words or 1800 words to bring to the group and be really, really excited about it and bring it there and then be reading it aloud. And all of a sudden on page three in paragraph four, there's 10,000 pronouns. And I'm thinking, who put all those pronouns in that paragraph? <laughs> it couldn't have been me, you know? So, I mean, it's a process. And then you have to hear if somebody doesn't like it. You know, there's a, the one story from, came from a critique group. The guy who ran the group, his name is Steve. He, he's uh, uh, outside the, the country now uh, with his wife, enjoying Europe. Um, but he, uh, we were reading and reading and reading, and it wasn't just the, the, the section that I brought with me on that particular day, because I'd been, I'd been part of the group for a couple of years at that point, um, because this really started as a part-time kind of hobby, and it really wasn't a real thing in my, my head until maybe a year and a half, two years ago. But in any case, so he said, when do these boys go to the bathroom? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, we're here, they're in the lifeboat, they're doing this, they're doing that. When do they go to the, when do they go to the bathroom? And it was like uh, the light bulb, you know, goes off in my head. And I start thinking, well, really? Yeah, everybody has to go to the bathroom. So why, why can't there be stuff about them going to the bathroom? And it opened up a whole way of me adding in how they go into the ship and they're, they're, they're getting told this is here and this is there and this is how it works. And I had to do all this research about the head on a ship and what it meant, where the officers went versus the, the lower seamen. And so it was, it was, and so now there's stuff in there about the bath, bathroom and there's stuff about them getting sick and, and throwing up. And you know, <laughs> there's all kinds of real things that happen to real people. So, so I'm very grateful. That's just one example, but those are the things that can come out of having a group of people 
that are your beta readers or a critique group. So it really helps you see your work more objectively. I, I just love when I hear you speak about this, that, that sometimes people think there's the, um, I'm thinking about writing a book and there's the, and here's the book. And, but honestly, this whole process to get from here to here, and, and some people think it's, it's hard, it's gonna take too long, it's gonna be Agnes. You know, I see the look on your face and this was such an adventure. And I it's love that. Incredible. It's I, incredible. I think that that's amazing. And all the things that you learn, I mean, certainly this is like, yes, it's in my hand. But, yeah. but hearing about learning about bathrooms and, and living with your characters and exploring and meeting people. And, you know, the whole process that went into learning a new craft and embracing the role of a writer, you know, this was not that arduous thing. People think it's just like, oh God, I don't want to do it. But no, I, the way your face lights up when you talk about the process, mm -hmm. it, it sound like, yes, let's go. Well, it, it might be a little bit of my inner geek coming out, you know. <laughs> That's good. I love it. I just, I just, it was a real journey for me. Um, as I said, it started more like a hobby, but um, I found like some really, a couple of, uh, I found a librarian who I wrote to in Hessel, England, which is where Robert is from. That's where he left. He ran from Hessel to the port of Hull, hid away on the ship in Hull, which was a big whaling port in the mid-1800s. So I found this woman and I said, I just want pictures of the, of the village from this time period. So when I'm describing him running down the street or some backstory or some flashback, it's accurate. I want it to, I want it to look to the reader how it looked walking down that, that dusty road in the middle of this little village in Southeast England. So she loved what I was trying to do she went back through the records and found my family and wrote me a 10 page handwritten letter with the entire family tree. And there's Robert in his little line with no married, no this, no that, only his date of birth because there's no records because he ran away. Um, but all the other siblings there, the brick makers, the, um, you know, the expert masons, you know, all of that was all there and she wrote me this whole long thing. It was really an incredible experience. Oh so, so sometimes people just latch onto your story and it takes you in a whole other way. I mean, I learned, I learned a lot about the evil older brother. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it made it into the book a little bit in that character development. So you never really know where those things are gonna come from. Oh. And sometimes you'd be surprised. Yeah. Oh, so good. I'm so glad you included other people in your journey. You know, so many times people think, oh, I don't want to bother somebody by asking. All I ever hear about librarians is they love this stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> love this. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Benjamin Franklin, for giving us the library. So oh. um, the library is an incredible resource, incredible. And my local librarian, so another a second research um, story would be I wrote a letter requesting a telephone interview with the director of naval history of, in the U.S. Navy. Um, so I wanted to know, you know, how did they scrub the deck? What was the command structure? And my father had done some military stuff, and he, so he had given me some idea and some outline, but I, I really wanted some real nitty-gritty stuff. So I had written him a letter. His secretary called me. She said, tell me what you're doing. I told her about the project. So she's like, oh, this sounds great. Submit your question. So I'm thinking, I, this is my personality. I'm going for broke. I have this guy's ear. <laughs> I'm just going to hit him with everything in the kitchen sink and hope I don't wreck it, you know. So I, I submitted a bunch of questions, like a whole page. And he responded. He did answer some. He did answer some. But this is my teach a man to fish or give a man a fish moment of writing. So he submitted back to me a two-page bibliography of books to reference, fiction and nonfiction. And some of them I actually bought, but many of them, sailor's journals, like crazy stuff. So I went to the librarian with this list and I'm thinking, you know, I tried to cherry pick. Some of them were like Moby Dick or White Jacket. Those were pretty readily available. Um, but some of them, there was one book in Kentucky there was one book in Nevada. There was what I mean, my librarian 
went all over the country ordering these books for me and calling me and saying the book is in, the book is in. And then I would have the book for only a certain amount of time and then I have to give it back. So I had these, I don't even, I should have, I should have had my composition, pile of composition notebooks, but all of my notes from the anatomy of a sale, like I drew it all out and how to tack a ship, how to wear a ship, what's the difference, you know, the box haul, the whole thing. So that when I wrote about it, it, it was as if it's all through Robert's eyes for the first time, because it was through my eyes for the first time, because I don't know how to sail. <laughs> <laughs> By now, you don't know how to sail? You just wrote this book? I could, I could walk you through. Um, <laughs> not this <laughs> but if I actually got up there myself, I'm not quite sure. Not quite sure. <laughs> I, did, I did go to Mystic, Connecticut, and I did ask if I could climb the mast to the crow's nest, and they said no. <laughs> they said, no, sorry, can't do it. I said, I'll harness, I'll well tether. No, 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 I'm not allowed to climb not at Mystic. But in any case, um, I did whatever I could possibly do to try to gain the feeling, the, the experience. You know, so if I went on a roller coaster with my daughter or on a Ferris wheel and you're way up high, I would imagine what if I was down there and this was a wave about to crash on my head because oh my gosh. happens when you're in the middle of the ocean and there's a hurricane. <laughs> you can have a hundred foot wave coming at you and it's like oh oh just a black wall of, of terrifying death and I mean you just you just can't imagine what that must have been like for a 12 year old kid so this is how I every time every time I was up high anytime I even sit in my backyard and look at the trees and the tree that's 40 feet and I imagine what if that's a wave coming at me and a series of waves coming at me with the wind blowing in every direction so Every little thing could be a way to bring yourself into that experience. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Your enthusiasm is infectious. I am <laughs> well, like I said, I want to just open up this book right now. I don't know. <laughs> but lots of people have read it now. You know, that's a scary thing when you put yourself out there to the public is you, somebody's not going to like it and you have to have a thick skin and you have to be okay with that. But so far, the educators that have read it, the curriculum directors have had um, administrators for schools read it, librarians reading it, regular people reading it, kids reading it, lots of good, lots of good um, feedback. So I'm excited about that. I'm very proud of it. And um, I just hope that if we touch a few people and get them into literature and get them excited about history, especially kids, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a good thing. Then, then mission accomplished. Oh my gosh, I'm so thrilled with all that. And it's not enough that you wrote this so that you can touch people, but now you're going to be sharing the adventure of writing. I am, I am. I'm beyond thrilled. Uh, Marguerite and I have been developing together. Well, I've been tagging along on- Well, <laughs> it's a collaboration. It's a collaboration. On a, on a creative writing course because you know, surveys say that 90% of the population wants to write a book, and, and you want to hang out with somebody who not only has done it, but is so excited, and I love that you, you are so insightful about the process, and that's what I think you really bring to the table as mm -hmm. far as a teacher, and why I asked if you would partner with me on creative writing, because your enthusiasm is infectious, and your insights into the process. So you and I have been talking about a host of things in preparation for the course, from, right. from story arc to character development, point of view, research, all of the different facets that go into something like this. Because right. It's all stuff that, that you're enthused about, which I love, absolutely love. <laughs> Well, it's just been such a learning experience for me going through the process of writing Robert's story. And it's very personal. Um, I feel like I can feel the positive energy from my grandparents, you know, really excited that I took this. Um, I, you know, I don't think when he handed me that story, he really had in his head the type of inheritance he was really giving me. This has been such an, a, a learning experience and growth experience. Um, personally, professionally, it's, it's helped me in a million different ways. Um, so, so to be having the opportunity by working with you to collaborate on this course, to be coming up with these worksheets. I'm coming up with these worksheets for this. Okay. Fabulous. Wait till you 
<laughs> and again, yeah, yeah, it's a little homework, but fun. Like I'm trying to make them fun. Um, and I, but it's also to reinforce the concepts to practice, to think outside the box about sentence structure, what to do, what not to do. And we're doing our live Q and A's for those people that are gonna take the class, right? So I'm a little bit geeking out about being so excited <laughs> about people coming into the live Q and A and talking about, did they do the worksheets? Did they like, you know, like I really wanna hear feedback. So, so I'm excited about that, yeah. I am so excited too, to, to, just to hear what kinds of stories people are going to be working on. You know, right yeah. now, Everything is a blank slate. We have all these blank worksheets. In just a few, you know, next week, the week after, people will be submitting. Here it is, all filled in. That's your story? How cool is that? <laughs> like, I can't even imagine when you show, show me some of the things you've developed, what types of things people are gonna fill in the blanks with. Yeah. It's gonna yeah. be. It's, it's a little bit, you can like think of it maybe as a Mad Lib. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I like that. Maybe we should use that in the promos. I think so. It's, it's a little bit like coming up with a with a Mad Lib. It <laughs> so, is. That's kind of, our next one. Look at those worksheets. Think of that. You know, yeah. you're filling in like a character development one where you fill in the character's name and then you're figuring out their backstory and their their things that their strengths, their weaknesses what their role is in the story, all of these ways of thinking about things that, I mean, I was actually thinking about people I know with the character development sheet. Things that- Right, right, I right. I have thought about that before, you know? <laughs> you're the writer. I mean, these characters are all coming from you. How exciting to make- I know, it's like, well, you know, and the bones of this course that we've been collaborating on come from the presentation I created to do school visits. Yes, I love that because- So, so the right, presentation so right, for, right, so the presentation for schools, which um, is not happening right now, might happen- okay. when we, It will be soon, soon. Uh, soon. Yes, yeah, soon. Um, so in, in those, I divided it into units so that teachers could choose the units of character development, world building, you know, our, wor our word play, where we, we talk about how to come up with different words and using the thesaurus and the world around you to come up with really creative ways to describe what's happening in your story. So there was the eight units. And so from those eight units, we, you and I expanded and made this four week class. So we delved into where we felt, you know, would be the most value for students, but that's where it, that's where it came from. The idea was building from that to this. So it's really exciting. And, like I said, if, if one person writes a chapter, writes a short story, writes a poem, writes a, I, I don't know what, like it- Whatever, it whatever. Taps into, right, taps into something, it's great. Just and also, as a freelance writer, some of the clients that I, that I work with doing some blogging and this and that, creative writing really helps me in that regard as well. And helping people look at their content, look at their communication with their clients, how are they providing value? You know, all of those things. And creative writing really helps because people are more drawn to stories. Mm -hmm. Tell people, people want to know why you're passionate about your business. Like, what is your business? What sets you apart from other people? So creative writing comes into that as well. So I'm so glad you said that because some people might be sitting there thinking, I can't write a novel, a short story, but honestly, in so many professions and areas of our life, writing is a skill. And if yes. you explore it in a creative way, then when you have to do it even in a dry way, even if you have to write a letter of complaint, even if you have to write for work, whatever. Make it colorful, right. Yeah, whatever it is, you know, we all have to write something for various reasons and doing it in a creative way, in a creative writing course, will only help all of those other things, which I think mm -hmm. is great. Yeah, yeah, so I'm really excited about launching it. Um, I'm excited to get feedback from the students and I'm really excited to see what work they oh, come up with. I'm excited to read the story. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. and, and all of that enthusiasm I see in you, because when you talk about the process, not just the finished book, which is fact, right. 
believe me, I love finished books. I live for finished books. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I'm so happy it's finished. <laughs> but 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 the it's the process. It's the journey. You know, I know people say it's not the journey. It's the destination. No, there's so much about. I'm so about journey. My right. favorite vacations in this world are road trips because I'm a firm believer in not just getting here and here, but I want to check out all the stuff in between. Yeah. And when you talk about the stuff in between, when you talk about research and learning more about a sail and a mast and going to the bathroom on a ship, that's so cool that you, you know that now. And yeah. whatever stories people are bringing, you know, they're going to learn more about whatever it is. If someone's writing, you know, paranormal romance, you're going to learn more about stuff that you never yeah. And then you're going to learn about okay. your characters and the world you're building. But you know what I think you learn the most about when you do all this is yourself. Completely, completely. I mean, my life is completely different um, now than it was um, before Labor Day. I, I just, in, in just these nine months, or I just have met incredible people with big hearts and, you know, giving to back to the community and um, networking and all of these things that I've done. And definitely after the launch, I feel a little bit like um, Kathleen Turner in the beginning of uh, Romancing the Stone. <laughs> and, uh, whoever, that's one of my favorite movies. I'm dating myself a little bit here, but, <laughs> so shh. But <laughs> in the beginning of the movie, she's writing so intensely and then there's sticky notes all over her house, by the cat food, by tissues, by this, by that. But she's been so engrossed in what her activity is that she doesn't have time for all those things. So I don't have sticky notes all over my house, but they're like in my head of all the things, the writing, the opportunities it's opened up, the people that I've met, the opportunity to speak with curriculum directors, librarians, educators across Long Island. It's really been an incredible experience. So, so I'm really, really grateful. Um, it is quite the inheritance my grandfather gave me. Oh that, my gosh. And, and, really and cool. quite a legacy you were leaving. You know, you got this inheritance, but look at the legacy you're leaving for your family, your children, someday, grandchildren, you know, nieces, yes. nephews, whatever it might be, all the way down the line. I mean, what family wouldn't want a record like this? Yeah. 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 Oh. And, and and, and when I think about where we can go once our three books are done with, th with this, there's a lot of splinter stories off here. Um, there's definitely some characters um, in each of the three books because the characters change, you know? So there's definitely some characters that we can do some splinter stories. Um, and I, I have some aspirations for a romance. <gasps> oh, so, you know, somewhere along the line, when the three books are done, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try my hand at maybe a romance, do something. Oh. But um, but it really wakes up your imagination, no matter what your genre. So it's so it's all good. Okay, I thought about writing romance one day too. So we're gonna have to talk about. That. Yeah, well, we're, yeah, we're gonna have to. I have I have the beginning characters, just what they do for a living, and then from there, it's it's I don't know what. So it's 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 in there somewhere in the back of my head. <laughs> well, I have no doubt that um, your course is going to give birth to a whole breed of um, obsessed with writing people <laughs> who I are hope so. I hope. loving yes. the process and the whole, I mean, what a creative outlet. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. And I'm hoping that with the slides and with the presentations, because it's very conversational when we're doing our videos, if you take yeah. the course, you'll see that. Um, but also the worksheets, um, I, you know, hope that that stands out from other creative writing classes in that you're really delving in and doing the work right from the beginning, um, learning about yourself, learning about what you want your concept, your story concepts to be. So, you know, I, I hope. Or the there is homework. There will yeah, be. yeah. But, but fun, fun homework. But um, I'm just hoping it sparks the creative, um, creativeness in, in just a handful of people. Yeah. I'd be very happy with that. You absolutely glow when you talk about writing. You do <laughs> absolutely glow. And who wouldn't want to be a writer meeting you? You know? Oh, well. You know, I'm like, wow, I should write. Look at her. She's doing <laughs> <laughs> She's doing it's been, Yeah. It's, it's really great. I, I love 
um, people saying that I'm an author, I'm a published author, I'm a writer, people meet me, they see me in networking groups, etc. Oh, Marguerite, she's a writer. I'm like, yes. <laughs> yes. Now tell me, I know you're, you're hard at work on book two of this series. Yes. Um, yeah. Going easier now that you have, you know, some, some weight under your wings here? I, I definitely, it's much easier to come up with the imagery um, <clears throat> because that is in a journey in and of itself when you're writing to step outside and get away from cliches, get away from just saying something's green. You know, um, just you have to like in the course, we talk about five senses, right? Using the five senses in every sense, in the action scenes, in the setting, as your world building, as you're in your dialogue with your characters and you're in the character's head in the narrative. I find that um, when I'm writing, I, that that is always my go to. That is always my fallback is how many senses can I get <laughs> in this page? where my reader can read this paragraph and smell it and taste it and feel it. And so, and so it's easier now to do that, um, but it's definitely, you know, I can spend, you know, several days on a page because wow. I can look at it and just say, I can say something better than ripple. The water's rippling. Like everybody says the water's rippling. It's gotta be doing something else that's like rippling, but not saying the word ripple. So it's sometimes I have to walk around the house, you know, sometimes I have to go to the beach. <laughs> so oh, it's- oh, That's too bad. Sometimes you have to bad. go to the beach. Bad, it's sad when I have to go to the beach for research. Yeah. <laughs> Do you hear this? There's going to the beach for research. When yeah, beach, book. beach. Yeah, no, I'm loving the research. I mean, it, started, it sounded at first like research, like school, but now she's at the beach, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if you're writing a story about windsurfing, you know, and you have access to windsurf, get out there and windsurf. Ooh, I want to write a story about windsurfing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what I want to do next, because I want to try that. Yeah, but like, interesting, if you want to write, let's say, a story about uh, where your character's a marine biologist, you know, you could get in touch with, we have tons of that on Long Island, tons of, of uh, aquariums and, and people doing research um, like that. Think about all the people you could meet and interview for character development, but, but it's gonna, it, it will bring, I will open your eyes to a million different other ways that you can go with your story and your characters and your setting when you do that, when you talk to people who are actually in the profession that your character may be doing in your book. So it's just an example, but. And, and you know what I love is that by being a writer and, and working on something, you kind of get to create your own reality is what I'm hearing from you. You know, I yeah. wanted to be a marine biologist back when I was a kid, obviously. Me too, I, me too. Me too. Me too. Yes. Okay. I love, I, I, I am a nature documentary crazy person. Oh. I love snorkeling. I had a shell collection. I oh, I still have a shell collection. <laughs> really? <laughs> but David Attenborough is like my favorite. He's my hero. I love him. And my Saturday morning coffee with David Attenborough telling me about the natural world. But yes, I used to want to be a, a, a man. Yeah. And you know, if, if that's something that I want to explore further, I mean, Maybe you might say, I'm a little old to go to marine biology school, but you know what? If I wrote a story and I needed to then be immersed and visit those people and do research and learn more about it, and how cool is this? This is like creating my own reality. And that's- Yeah, yeah, and you know, this is what actors do when they um, are preparing for roles. They go out in cop cars, they go out on fire trucks, they go out in the middle of the ocean if they're a boat captain. Um, you know, they, they go, they talk to soldiers who have been in the heat of battle. You know, this is, this is what you do when you're researching a role, if you want to bring authenticity to the screen. So in that way, as you're writing, you got to bring it to, to here so that the movie in your reader's mind is going and you're, you're just pulling them in and they want to be there. So, so that's, that's all part of that process. Absolutely. Well, I can't imagine that there is anybody who, after hearing from you, 
doesn't want to grab a pen and paper and get started. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. You know, I'm going to be doing this class on creative writing. I will be crashing the class because I really want to participate also. Right. <laughs> it's going to be so exciting to get started. Get started on your story. I have no idea what your story is. Maybe it's romance. Maybe it's a mystery. Maybe it's a family history. I don't know what it's going to be. But boy. It could be a romance with a marine biologist. Could be that. Could be that. Could be that. I well, I know one thing. I'm going to be there taking a peek at all of the worksheets as we're going along because I can't wait to see if, if there's somebody who's a romance with a marine biologist. I'm going to die laughing. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to be great. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so right. please sign up because. We can't wait. We're just like dying to read your stuff. Um, and yeah. classes.com, and that's where you can sign up. And I have no doubt that there's going to be many, many more courses to come. This is our first, but I, I think this can't be our last because you and I are having way too much fun. Oh, we, we're having a ball. And, and it has been so much fun and so challenging and all new. Again, a new thing for me is been developing this course and, and trying to come up with ways to get people engaged and involved in their own. And writing books, so let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. All right, and as we, you'll see as we end every single class, happy writing. Happy writing. Thanks for joining us on Between the Covers. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're an author who would be interested in appearing on our show, or perhaps you're a member of a book club, we do host book clubs as well, please visit BetweenTheCoversTV.com. By the way, at BetweenTheCoversTV.com, you can watch past episodes in addition to learning more about our authors and guests. So sign up there if you would like to be a guest on the show yourself. And if you have some books that you would like to get written or published, visit redpenguinbooks.com. Thanks so much for joining us.